Over its 80 years of existence, the Soviet Union left its urban mark on a stretch of territory ranging from Berlin to the Kamchatka Peninsula, and influenced others all over the world. It produced some beautiful urban landscapes and generated some ideas that were decades ahead of their time, but also constructed industrial wastelands and pioneered some disastrous projects. In this first episode of Sotskorod, we'll cover a basic outline of the history and practice of Soviet urban planning. Our primary sources are Planning in the Soviet Union, a 1981 book by Dr. Judith Pallett, as well as the English translation of Sotskorod, an early theoretical Soviet urban planning text and the namesake of this series. We'll also be making copious use of Russian and Polish newsreels from the communist era to illustrate our discussion. Let's get started. The 1917 revolution and ensuing conflicts caused significant damage in Russian cities. For example, one assessment immediately following the Russian Civil War estimated that between 10 and 20% of housing in Russia's major cities was simply beyond repair. Additionally, urban planning had been relatively neglected as a discipline by socialist thinkers before this time, so there were few ready-made plans on how to build a socialist city. Marx and Engels had written about the abolition of distinction between town and country, but nobody was really sure what that meant in practice. As a result, the first decade of Soviet rule was filled with imaginative speculation and theorizing on the topic, combined with more pragmatic efforts to simply rebuild what had been destroyed. The concept of garden cities, recently popularized in the West, was enthusiastically imported, with several such towns proposed, but never built. Visions for new housing in this period remained idyllic and suburban, as was the Western fashion at the time. For example, some plans called for small cooperatives composed of what were essentially cottages. This model is perhaps best exemplified in the proposed Greater Moscow Project, which imagined new urban development broken up by massive radial parks with a grand green belt around the edge of the city. Few of these plans ever came to fruition. No serious effort was made to define a new urban model until the 1928 five-year plan, prior to which architects and planners had largely worked only on individual buildings. Modernism reached maturity in Soviet urban planning with the publication of Sotskorod, abbreviated Russian for Socialist City. Written by Nikolai Alexandrovich Milyutin, a communist functionary, in 1930, it formally outlined a brutally modernist program for a new Soviet urban planning. His proposed buildings, with their simple shapes, harsh angles, smooth surfaces, and ample use of glass, would fit into any 20th century modernist project. His real innovations, however, were in urban planning itself. He argued that cities should be planned using the same concepts as are used to design assembly lines, a model he termed the linear industrial settlement. Striving towards that abolition of all distinction between town and country, he opposed the continued concentration of industrial development in just a few cities, proposing that both industries and populations should be more widely dispersed from established city centers. His residential plans called for population dispersal away from slum-filled inner cities and into large and pastoral suburban developments, surrounded by copious green space. In line with the new communal ideology, housing was designed to encourage the sharing of most activities, with personal privacy reduced to a minimum as a result. Milyutin's influence was soon cut short, however, and Milyutin himself was publicly denounced only a year after Sotskorod's publication. The party instead settled on an orthodoxy of continued urban concentration and big city planning, while architecturally, Milyutin's modernism was rejected for socialist realism, sometimes called the classical socialist style, which came to dominate under Stalin, and best represented by the so-called Stalinist wedding cakes, 
like the Moscow State University or Warsaw's Palace of Culture. Milyutin's theorizing was not in vain, however. His work was influenced by, and in turn influenced, Le Corbusier and Germany's Bauhaus School, while some of his ideas saw an indirect Soviet resurgence in later periods. In line with the first few five-year plans, Soviet urban planning in the 1930s and early 40s prioritized heavy industry, with entire cities built from scratch around new industrial zones. Chief among them, Magnitogorsk. Built up from nothing near an especially rich iron deposit in the middle of the steppe, Magnitogorsk presented the opportunity to plan a socialist city from scratch. The steel mill took priority, with many residents still living in tents or crude shacks long after the first blast furnace was opened in 1931. But by the late 30s, a grand city had taken shape. Architecture remained simple, but collectivized social services were largely in place by the end of the decade, with communal baths, laundries, daycares, and cafeterias open to residents. Ironically, the German planner brought in to design the city, Ernst May, had been influenced by Milutin's theories, and designed Magnitogorsk along the linear industrial lines described in Sotskorod. In fact, May went on to plan some 20 cities across the USSR in this period. He thus left a strong modernist mark on the nation's urban space, even though he himself was denounced by the authorities just a few years later. However, the overall housing situation still deteriorated. Between 1923 and 1940, official statistics note that the average per capita living space in Soviet cities declined from 6.23 square meters to only 4.09 square meters, or about 44 square feet. The war interrupted most urban planning activities, but its end saw new opportunities as a population boom had to be accommodated in ruined cities. While the 30s had seen industrialization prioritized, the USSR was now able to shift more resources towards residential and commercial development instead. Both destroyed cities, like Warsaw and Minsk, and new sites, like the West Bank of Magnitogorsk or Kraków's Nova Huta suburb, were built in peak classical socialist form. Blocky but ornamented apartments four or five stories tall, wide boulevards and abundant plazas, and large green spaces. Ornamentation was neoclassical in form, with columns and representations of workers, while buildings were generally built with brick or stone. Many of these sites remain highly sought after real estate to this day, though their proximity to industry remains a problem. Built around massive steel mills, both Magnitogorsk and Nova Huta were clouded in heavy smog for decades, and Magnitogorsk especially still sees significantly elevated cancer rates due to the Soviet practice of clustering housing around heavy industry. As demand for housing continued to increase in the 50s, cost-cutting measures were increasingly adopted. Ornamentation and the classical socialist style were dropped in favor of prefabricated concrete buildings, and by the early 60s, cheap four- and five-story Khrushchevkas, named after then-premier Nikita Khrushchev, were being mass-produced all over the Eastern Bloc. However, historical preservation was still accommodated. The historic core of St. Petersburg, then Leningrad, was well-maintained throughout the 20th century where planners pioneered an entire field of centralized historical preservation of buildings and parks, while in Warsaw, the entire Old Town, reduced to rubble in World War II, was rebuilt into a near-perfect replica of the original by the communist authorities, even as the rest of the city was rebuilt along more modern lines. By the Brezhnev period in the 70s, the general principles of Soviet urban planning had been established, with 62% of Soviet citizens living in cities by 1979 compared to less than a fifth before World War I. The basic unit of new Soviet neighborhoods, perhaps equivalent to the American subdivision, was the mikrorayon, or microdistrict. Housing anywhere between 3 and 20,000 residents, the mikrorayon was made up of a cluster of apartment buildings, 
typically of differing heights, containing schools, small shops, clinics, and other basic services at ground level, and surrounding an open recreational space in the center, which typically contained a playground or sports field. Each microrayon was isolated from major traffic arteries, and the interior was restricted to all but very light traffic. The enclosed nature of the microrayon greatly reduced the level of noise pollution experienced by residents, something still visible, or rather audible, to this day. The traffic on Andersa Road in north-central Warsaw, for example, is generally very loud. However, if we move a short distance into the microrayon visible in the background, the noise fades away. In fact, the traffic is now so quiet that birds and insects easily drown it out, even though we're only about 70 meters from that avenue. This design was formalized by Soviet planners in the concept of neutral zones, quiet areas separated from zones of movement, like major roads and transit routes. Internally, the microrayon was designed so that every resident could access their daily needs within a short walk, preferably within 500 meters of their residence. As an example, let's look at a typical microrayon in the western half of the Vyepshino neighborhood in southern Warsaw. The area is bounded by major roads carrying trams and bus routes, but interior streets are narrow and quiet. A small park in the center contains sports fields, while playgrounds and pedestrian pathways are spread throughout, under dense tree cover. Several preschools, elementary schools, and a high school are present in the interior, along with small groceries and pharmacies. Larger facilities, like a library, post office, church, and office building are built on the periphery, along with transit stations. Walking from the center of this microrayon to the edge takes less than five minutes, making everything comfortably accessible on foot. But this sort of hyper-local service provision was not especially cost-effective, even if it made a neighborhood highly walkable, and by the mid-70s, official norms encouraged greater service centralization, New microrayons were increasingly built to accommodate more people, and new developments had fewer but larger schools and shops. For example, in 1961, the average shop in Moscow covered 182 square meters, but planners hoped to increase this to 415 square meters by 1981, while schools were increasingly built to accommodate up to a thousand students rather than just a few hundred. Perhaps the most extreme example is the so-called Falovets apartment block built in Gdańsk in the early 70s, which stretches on for nearly a kilometer and houses some 6,000 people. More characteristic is the Zabianka neighborhood in the same city, built around the same period. Blocks are much taller than in early developments, and the open space between them is sparser. The amenities are still there, for example, Residents in these blocks have easy access to a preschool, two playgrounds, assorted small shops, and a pharmacy. The result, however, is significantly more desolate than our earlier examples, a pattern visible today from Slovakia to Siberia. Even with this construction, however, by 1976, Soviet cities had an average of only 8.1 square meters of housing per resident which was still below standards that had been set all the way back in 1922. In addition, planning standards established strict per capita quotas for all sorts of services towards which cities were supposed to strive. For example, norms established in the 50s demanded 5.8 theater seats, 35 cinema seats, and 5 hotel beds per thousand people. In practice, these standards were rarely met, even by the late 70s, these quotas were typically at half or less of their target amounts, and much lower than that in small towns and villages. Finally, commercial activity was also centralized, 
and the 60s were the golden years of grand supermarkets in city centers. Szkło, aluminium, powietrze i światło. Oto podstawowe materiały, z których stworzono tę nową ozdobę architektoniczną Warszawy. However, as city populations grew, it was recognized that locating all major stores in the city center made things difficult for those living further out. And by the 70s, it was official policy to build trade centers throughout cities. In some ways comparable to Western malls and strip malls, these trade centers were estimated to save between 5 and 10% on land, construction, and operating costs by combining many businesses and services under one roof, according to a 1976 planning study. Much like the Western world in this same period, continued greenfield residential development led to suburbanization as neighborhoods in the city center were transformed away from residences and into hubs of commercial, cultural, and administrative activity. Between 1960 and 1975, for example, the population of Moscow's central core declined by half, curiously matching a similar trend in major American cities at the same time. But this is where the similarity with the West ends. For one, Soviet cities were typically bounded by forest park zones, what we would call green belts, which limited urban sprawl to an extent. While transport policy emphasized robust mass transit over car infrastructure where walking was not feasible. That last point is critical. By 1975, it was official policy that wherever possible, Cities or districts with less than 20,000 people should be entirely livable on foot, without need for cars or mass transit. This policy was motivated as much by idealism as by financial constraints. It was simply cheaper to build walkable and transit neighborhoods than to supply everybody with a car. As a result, by 1976 there were only 12 cars per thousand people across the USSR. To this day, suburbs as Westerners think of them are rare in post-Soviet cities. In Warsaw, for example, apartment blocks continue right up to the edge of the city, beyond which there is an immediate transition to farmland. Even this limited suburbanization caused issues, with commutes sometimes lasting well over an hour from the more distant suburbs of the largest cities. As financial pressures mounted, new housing was built cheaper, taller, and in a more standardized form. New microrayons in this period increasingly contained tall, repetitive towers rather than the lower, clustered buildings of earlier decades. Often built on otherwise barren terrain, I've heard these developments described as vertical subdivisions, no less alienating than their horizontal American equivalents of the same period. On the bright side, inner city redevelopment became favored over outward expansion with a Soviet study from this period suggesting that redeveloping a core neighborhood, rather than building a new one on the periphery, saved up to 400,000 rubles per hectare, equal to over half a million dollars at the time, or about two and a half million dollars today. And as we saw earlier, the enclosed design of the microrayon allowed for green and quiet neighborhoods to be built, even in city centers. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, urban planning in the Eastern Bloc adapted to the new, neoliberal conditions. Tall commercial districts arose in city centers, green space was paved over for parking lots, single-family suburbs developed, and grand, state-sponsored urban developments were largely replaced by widespread private construction. Yet, the old Soviet model is still widely visible today with private developments sometimes inspired by or outright rehabilitating socialist designs. We'll talk more about the legacy of Soviet planning in future videos, along with deeper explorations of utopian new cities like Nova Huta, the socialist urbanism of Milyutin, Soviet architecture, and many other topics. For now, thanks for watching.